Hi, my name is John Schmidt, and I work for the Agricultural Research Service at the Minneapolis Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska. And my unit is the Meat Safety and Meat Quality Research Unit. So, <coughs> but it's kind of broadened out in the general food safety, anything related to cattle and swine. So that's our interest in manure, and actually with <coughs> Lisa and Dan and Amy Schmidt and others at UNL, uh, we have a lot of research planned, upcoming research plan to investigate food safety aspects and antimicrobial resistance aspects of manure along with the rest of the farm to fork continuum. Okay. Okay. So, so infectious disease and antibiotics. The biggest take home point is almost all modern medicine foundation is antibiotics. And the WHO, World Health Organization, has estimated that premature, de premature deaths be 40% higher in antibiotics than they exist. And the director of the CDC, Thomas Frieden, um, recently brought to professional attention the increasing prevalence of antibiotics and diseases. And the ones he highlighted are listed there the bullet points. Um, and what I have is he indic indicated that most of the highest priorities were methicillin resistance to aborias, which is commonly called MRSA. MDR stands for multi drug resistant, which many times people incorrectly call super bugs, including mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the cause of agent of TB in most cases. Um, MDR gram negatives, which are a grouping of bacteria that includes E. coli. Um, E. coli is very broad, actually includes what we traditionally worry about, food safety, chicken pathogenic E. coli, which also called s -text, also other E. coli, Klebsiella, Cinebacter, uh, gonorrhea, Nyxeria, gonorrhea, the cause of agent of gonorrhea, um, Cephalosporin resistant Salmonella, and Fluoroquinone resistant Campylobacter. The ones in red are highlighted that way because those are ones with some type of link to meat animal production and traditional infections are caused through consumption of meat products. In blue is MRSA because there's been a lot of press about the link between, potential link between animal agriculture and MRSA. But almost any level-headed investigator has come to the conclusion that MRSA is not coming through the food supply. There's concerns about occupational health, which is not exactly a strong scientific foundation yet. But uh, one of the things I want to highlight is, is some of the other ones, there's actually not a link to that animal culture, despite being made here in the press. And of course, there's many declarations from many organizations that the critical threat, or the most critical threat to public health, is all involving fears or training that pre antibiotic error when most of your deaths were due to infectious disease. And this slide emphasizes that we are not going to invent our way out of the problem because we do not have any novel classes of antibiotics on the horizon. And this is a timeline showing the introduction of various antibiotic classes of clinical use. And what you can see, the 50s and the 60s were the golden age. Essentially, every year, every other year, we had it, a whole new class of antibiotics being introduced. So if something became resistant to cycling, well, we had glycopeptides or cyclopsarins waiting right there to fill the gap. And um, this the reason why we don't have any novel antibiotics on the horizon is a couple different, close a couple different factors. One is we may have actually exhausted the potential antibiotics out there. When the drug companies actually had very large and well-funded um, discovery programs, what they generally find are compounds that are related to the existing compounds. The other problem is the discovery, development, and regulatory costs, costs are all very high, and the failure rate is very high. There's a whole series of steps that a new antibiotic has to meet, and the failure rate each step is greater than 90%. And then finally, of course, the pharmaceutical companies are in business to make money. And the drugs with the highest return on investment are things that are for chronic diseases like diabetes that you'll be taking this drug for the rest of your life. Antibiotics, you take the antibiotic and you cure. So it's a very short 
period that you will be treated with. So all these come together to essentially we're going to have to move forward with the antibiotics that we have. The prospects for new antimicrobial classes are very dim. Again, the CDC last year published a what has really become a, I guess for lack of a better term, a benchmark. The Educhemo report specifically listed what they saw as the biggest antibiotics and threats in the U.S. and came up with a, a number of illnesses, an estimation, I should say, of the number of illnesses and deaths due to antibiotic resistant infections. And the after is not just bacteria, but also fungal infections are included in the report. And anything like this with the epidemiological est estimation, there's a median and a high and low number. And for this top level re report, which you might even see in this figure grab in the media reports, this is the minimum. Each year, there's at least 2 million illnesses complicated by antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance and 23,000 deaths. But only a portion of these are due to infection to the causal link to animal agriculture. And this is a summary of all these specific organisms and resistance, resistance organisms the CDC listed as either being the most urgent concern, a serious concern, or something we should be concerned about for the future. And if you sum up the average number of deaths, it's 2.3 million, a little higher than 2 million, lower limit for infections and 38,000 deaths. And what I have in red text, which doesn't actually come up very good on this screen here, are the ones with a demonstrated believable link to animal agriculture. And you only have three groups, which are the drug resistant Campylobacter, extended spectrum beta lactamase producing Enterobacteriaceae, and E. coli include E. coli and Salmonella are both Enterobacteriaceae, and drug resistant non typhoidal Salmonella, which uh, very briefly, right below it, we have drug resistant Salmonella type E. Salmonella type E, the host is humans. Non typhoidal Salmonella is pretty much comes through the food supply, comes through, through meat. But you sum them up, the infections only count for 436,000, like 19% of the overall antibiotic infections in the US, and only 2,200 deaths, which is 6%. Not to, to reduce the impact and importance of those deaths, but what I want to get at is the problem is actually far larger than any possible contribution to animal agriculture. And the solutions are going to come not just from changing potential changes in animal agricultural practices, but 80% of the problem comes from human uses. And that cannot be, should not be brushed over. And again, this is actual text and report. What I've highlighted here is 50% of the antibiotics prescribed for people are not needed or are not an optimal prescription. But then the next sentence, two sentences down, the CDC would like you to use the antibiotics for promoting growth is not necessary and the practice should be phased out. So that is CDC stance, not necessarily USDA stance. And it kind of always comes along with it in many of these reports that they kind of put blame in some cases solely on the animal agricultural use, which is most certainly not the case. So antibiotics, human health, and animal ag, there's a fair amount of cross-talk controversy in this amongst the various interest groups. But what I have here is two broad points that there's pretty much consensus on, at least the overall points. And what is all part of the relationship is extremely complex. But the first point is that antimicrobial resistance is a naturally occurring phenomenon. And Lisa just shows you a bunch of slides demonstrating that it's been around long before uh, humans and <clears throat> long before our use of antibiotics in industry. And that this resistance is present with or without the use of antibiotics. The second point, there is consensus that any time an antibiotic is used in areas of ecosystem, it contributes in some way to the presence of antibiotic resistance. 
And what I have here is a cartoon of all different potential interactions between humans, um, antibiotics, and agricultural applications. And what you really, all the contrary revolves around really how thick these arrows should be. And a lot of it's because, as Lisa showed, it's a puzzle and we have only very few puzzle pieces. And a lot of the research now that we're doing is to try to get a sense of how thick each of those arrows is, what the rate is of transfer of resistance between these different points or inputs. Again, this is the same journal article that Lisa showed where one of the best studies showing their resistance to aging was they took 30,000 year old permafrost in the Yukon and isolated all these antibiotic resistance genes out of it, including vicomycin and beta lactam, some very important antibiotic drugs they're using a lot of times. And it shows that this is an ancient natural phenomenon. And a few other findings or things to, to emphasize as an ancient natural phenomenon is that. First, many bacterial species synthesize antibiotics, and they do this to establish their own niche to kill other bacteria. But as a part of that antibiotic synthesis, they must possess a resistance mechanism so they're not killed by their own antibiotic. So that is the reason why we have antibiotic resistance genes and we've had them. For as other complex genetic analysis have shown that these resistance genes existed for more than two billion years. Essentially, resistance is as old as, they, as the bacteria themselves. And then finally, the last point I want to emphasize this is, of course, we all know penicillin was the first antibiotic for commercial use, but bacterial resistance was first reported in penicillin in 1940, which predated the first commercial and broad, broadly, broad uses of therapeutic uses by two years. That happened in 1942. And there have been several um, quantitative risk assessments of animal uses of antibiotics and animal outbreak. And they all come up with a very small impact, is the conclusion. And so, we're, even though these studies are out there, they seem to be overlooked. So, the real question is even with a low impact of animal agriculture use on human health, how much, how much impact is what we consider important and for their studies to fill in the gaps to have a better understanding. And also, even though these studies have shown a low potential impact on health, why do we have um, the continued pressure to re restrict our agriculture uses? And the best case study comes from Europe and Denmark in the 1990s. And this involves uh, antibiotic, a glycopeptide antibiotic called avioparsin that is once used as a feed additive in Europe, not in the US, and the glycopeptide mycomycin, which is used in, uh, <coughs> in humans to treat serious infections. And you can see their structures and their method of action are actually very similar. So, avioparsin was used in growth promotion in Europe, but never used in the US. But the U.S. use of vancomycin in humans is higher than in Europe. The levels of vancomycin resistant aerocoxide, which aerocoxide are a part of the natural flora of any mammal, but they're an opportunistic pathogen. So especially if they're symptoms of gut trauma, it can cause a serious infection. Um, so levels of BRE in EU food animals, meat, and human commensal flora are higher in Europe than in the U.S. And it was concluded that this was due to the avioparsin use in Europe. So first Denmark and then the EU banned the use of it to lower those levels. And following that ban, the BRE level dropped in Europe in food animals meat and human commensal flora. So this was seen as a success. And of course, any time there's success, there has to be some type of follow-up. Right? So based upon that success, Denmark in particular and the EU following a little more slowly started relying upon the, what they term the cross-chain principle, which is where there are threats of serious irreversible damage, lack of scientific certainty, should not postpone what is considered cost-effective measures to reduce risk to humans. And based upon this, they slowly started banning 
essentially all other than therapeutic uses of antibiotics, and even started to be some therapeutic uses of antibiotics. And the idea was this was going to have some type of positive public health impact, reduce human antibiotic resistant infections. But of course, this was not actually based on any type of scientific weight. And what has happened is these bans have not had the desired impact on human health. So Denmark in particular has a comprehensive antibiotic medicine monitoring program. They monitor a variety of antibiotic medicine organisms from both animals, both companion and food production, foods, and humans. Both, um, they both take uh, clinical samples and some healthy human samples. And what you have here is resistance in E. coli blood isolates in humans in Denmark, and you can see the figure on the left is, is uh, I'm sorry, so the figure on the right is a lot of the figure on the left, but it shows increasing resistance over time, even after these restrictions. The number of MRSA cases, which again, some people think there's a link to animal agriculture, use of antibiotics, and they believe that restricting sub therapeutic uses would have a positive impact. You can see in Denmark, they've still have an increase in MRSA cases in humans. And even in animals, animal health, there's an increase in resistance of sound and outside the in Denmark over this time period. So the take home from this is these simple bans will not solve the problem. There's no easy answer to this. So, what we can conclude from this is, as Lisa, and as you probably know, as Lisa's mentioned in probably, and you know, the use of antibiotics in animal culture is perceived to contribute significantly to the occurrence of human infections, even in spite of scientific evidence that has shown that resistance is ancient, occurs naturally, and that comparable levels of antibiotic resistant genes are found in environments with varying exposures to anthropogenic, meaning human use of antibiotics. And the animal agriculture will continue to be blamed for these infections because there's a lack of studies directly examining relative occurrences of antimicrobial resistant bacteria and genes in conventional production environments and other environments. So at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, we have instituted a large antimicrobial resistance research program. And we had three goals, and they're the overall objective is to address the most critical data gaps relating to antibiotic use in meat animals. And the first one is to determine the baseline levels of antibiotic bacteria in meat animal production environments and the final products. The second is to increase our scientific understanding of why antibiotic bacteria persist in these production environments, even in the absence of antibiotic use. And the third is to determine the impact of our uses on resistance, particularly clinically important resistance, and evaluate mitigation methods if they're warranted. So I want to highlight a couple of studies we completed or process completed that emphasize some of our work we're doing. The first has to do with safety fear, which uh, those of you involved in animal production know it's a very important antibiotic used to treat several diseases, including the case of cattle, bovine respiratory disease, also sometimes called chicken fever. And why this is a concern is septia cure, called, you know, by the trade name, the acetonoxal and cephalosporin, that in addition to be used in animal agriculture, is very important to human medicine. And actually, in both the CDC and it's truly the WHO's classification is the highest priority antibiotic class. And it's because for serious invasive salmonella and E. coli infection, it's the drug of choice. And especially for salmonella infections in, in children, it is the only drug option we have. And to make a long story short here is we investigated uh, what happens to cattle populations where septic fear is used to treat BRDC? And a uh, population we had at the Animal Research Center, we had 50 cattle that were inject injected with septic fear in October when these cattle arrived. They arrived at the end of September, so they're most susceptible to BRDC. And what you can see is this prevalence of septic fear resistant E. coli, or cephalosporin E. coli. And we 
have a transient increase in the fecal population following treatment. And that's completely expected because what happens is all the susceptible E. coli die and briefly the resistant E. coli occupy the space that the susceptible ones once did. But there's a whole bunch of susceptible E. coli in the fetal environment and very quickly by December when they were sampled again the prevalence of drug resistant E. coli had dropped back to the level it was previously. And it remains at that low level throughout the time there. And in short, animals that were treated with cephalosporins, where they go from the fecal population, their high population, with the high plays a much greater role in contamination of the final product, where in processing look no different than when they arrive or their untreated permits. And that's emphasized here which has no effect either by the, this, this animal herd, the overall herd being at a feedlot that use cephalosporins. And you can see the cephalosporin use <coughs> went from nothing before the outcapture is very low. Uh, October was the highest. And you can see the fecal and the high <coughs> levels of cephalosporins as E. coli were relatively level, no significant difference from when they arrived over the entire time they're there. So the overall level, overall prevalence of cephalosporin E. coli did not increase for cattle residing in a feedlot using septic fuel. The next study I will briefly mention here is this is something we did in collaboration with Lisa, is we wanted to examine the prevalence of antibiotic bacteria in a variety of habitats. Uh, and what we looked at were uh, cattle waste, so a cattle retention pond, and also manure pile, swine waste, retention pond, and again, we can kind of for a pile of, of waste that it's a swine operations, and also human waste water plants. We took um, the effluent, but also some dewatered human waste that was eventually going to be used for uh, land application. And <coughs> what we found were, for these are different types of cephalosporin resistant E. coli, a different type of drug resistant E. coli called trimethoprim sulfamethazole, which is the drug of choice for treating human urinary tract infections, which some people think there is a link to meat consumption and human E. coli cause urinary tract infections. Cephalosporin resistant salmonella, now this is acid resistant salmonella, which uh, in adults, the other treatment option are, are class called fluoroquinolones. Uh, and the obviously acid is a, is a quinolone drug, <laughs> and <coughs> macrolide resistant aerococci, which is a, a group of bacteria, gram positive bacteria, used as an indicator of antibiotic resistance. And what we found were the drug resistant bacterial prevalences were very similar between human cattle and swine, showing that. Cat, you know, animal agriculture is by no means the only source of these antibiotics and bacteria. Finally, we looked at the effectiveness of these processing interventions in the removal of antibiotics and bacteria. Because concerns have been raised as these antibiotics and bacteria persist through processing and may potentially contaminate final products. Now here we have, again, cephalosporin-resistant E. coli, trimethoprim-resistant E. coli, cephalosporin-resistant salmonella, and now this acid-resistant salmonella. And we measure this, the high of the feedlot, the high of the plant, the pre evisceration properties, and the final properties. And what you can see is almost all cattle leave the feedlot and begin processing with antibiotics and bacteria and hives. You may notice that our prevalence of cephalosporin-resistant E. coli is much higher than my first study. In the reason for this is between that study and this study, we were able to incorporate much more sensitive methods, which of course are more sensitive and found more drug resistant bacteria. What I was not shown on this slide because I wanted to condense things to keep us within the time limit, is we were also able to measure the concentrations. The concentrations start out relatively high on the feed lot hide and plant hide, but are very low where we see the prevalence on the previous carcass showing that the Interventions work, and of course, the final carcass, the few positives we had there, the, the concentrations were extremely low. And the 
So it demonstrates that the currently employed processing infections actually do effectively remove the antibiotics and bacteria. So what are we doing now in the future? We'd like to compare uh, the prevalence of these very important, clinically important resistant antibiotics bacteria and the genes and the feces of cattle that were raised and out of antibiotics and eventually raised. And this is actually ongoing research and again demonstrating that it's a natural phenomenon. The levels of antibiotics and bacteria during some sampling periods is identical between cattle raised without antibiotics and conventionally raised. During some other periods they're slightly higher than conventionally raised but the take home is that it is a natural phenomenon and actually season may play a bigger role um, in the prevalence of these resistant bacteria than drug use. We're also about to begin examining um, ground beef and pork that has been produced that has a label claim for AFI antibiotics and no label claim. We are collaborating with researchers at UNL to examine uh, to do a quantitative microbial risk assessment of the antibiotic uses in beef cattle and public health risk. Uh, we are also collaborating with UNL and uh, ARS researchers at uh, Lincoln into uh, the roles of antibiotic residue in feedlot pen soil and the persistence of these residues in antibiotic bacteria and the absence of use of also when these uh, pen soils are scraped off, piled in manure, and then eventually they apply. And finally, we're evaluating uh, potential mitigation practices, including the incorporation of lime, to see what the effect is on antibiotic bacteria. And with that, I'll acknowledge my main collaborators at the Miami Research Center, at the ARS location in Lincoln, and of course at the University of Nebraska. I'll take any questions. Yes. Um, did your statistics on resistance include people who have allergies to those drugs? Um, or were they just people who no. had antimicrobial products? Uh, for my actual research, it's all been on um, on farm and in products. Uh, I think what you're turning to the, the other statistics, the CDC statistics, that is actually just due to infections. It's not um, people who are allergic. Um, in terms of allergic reaction to um, an actual administered drug for a therapeutic treatment that's not included in those statistics. And the other thing that's important to emphasize is in terms of the concerns about consumption of meat animal products and antibiotics. There, the USDA certifies and has a testing program to certify that all of your meat products are free of antibiotics. So there should not actually be antibiotics contaminating, there should be no residues contaminating the meat product. However, bacteria are everywhere and there is potential for the antibiotics the bacteria to go through the meat supply or also to come from cross-contamination from some other source. All right, so there are two different problems, but there should not be, in the USDA certifies, there should not be the actual antibiotic contaminating any food product, especially any meat product. Yes? Is there a, uh, is there a way to make research being done on the, on the effect of not, not by us. Um, I know of research relating to hormones and residues. Uh, again, meat is examined for those residues, but um, also in terms of animal welfare issues. But it's not research that I've done. It's not really. I'm a microbiologist, not a a um, cell biologist or a animal scientist. So I know of that research, but I don't know of any conclusions of that. There, there is some research out there too, even in my ARS, on what happens to this kind of residue 